This episode brought to you by MeepleRealty.com, your source for high-quality custom board game inserts. Meeple Realty, think inside the box. Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today I'm bringing you my top 20 favorite games of all time, and I'm going to give it to you in 20 minutes. All right, so what we're doing is, uh, I don't have a green screen because I still haven't set it up. I'm still trying to figure out which wall in my new space here I'm going to use it on. We'll get it figured out eventually, but instead we're just gonna have a nice picture pop up right here. So going back to the way it was before I had the green screen. All right, so now uh, the way this works is I'm gonna start a timer here in just a second, and we'll give you each of these games in a minute or less, and we're gonna roll through them real fast, and you're gonna get the whole top 20 treatment real quick, okay? Uh, now these games are for games that I have played, not necessarily that I own. So some of these I, I have played maybe even once or twice, but they've made enough of an impression on me to stick to the uh, top 20. And I've played roughly, well actually not roughly, hold on, I'll tell you exactly how many different games I've played. Now I've played 121 different games, so this is roughly, you know, a, a little bit less than, the, than my uh, top 20% of games uh, that I've played. So let's get right into it, starting right now. Number 20 is Roll for the Galaxy. Now this is a game I do not own. I actually got to play it down in uh, Florida one time with a, a buddy of mine named Nestor, and he uh, showed me quite a few different games that I, that I hadn't played before. Trajan, Roll for the Galaxy though, was one that definitely uh, stuck in my head and is a game that I am absolutely going to want to get a hold of eventually. It's on my wish list. This is a game where you, you're rolling dice. It takes Race for the Galaxy, a really uh, in-depth card game, and distills it into, well, I don't know if it distills it, but it turns it into a dice game. This one can still be a little tricky to pick up on. It's got a couple of mechanisms that are not intuitive, but once you understand them, they work really, really well. It's one of these things where if one person selects a... Uh, uh, an action, then everyone's going to get to do that action, and you're trying to build in a uh, abstracted way, build your civilization, uh, your space civilization. That's Roll for the Galaxy. Number 19 is Century Spice Road. Now, this is one from Plan B Games. There's also a Golem edition of it, exact same game, different theme. In this one, you're trading spices and you are trying to be the first one. I can't, I believe it's a certain number of points. I've only played this one twice. This, this one was up in Ohio with a buddy of mine named Carl. Um, and it, it's got some pretty cool artwork. It's got these really cool little cubes that represent different, four different spices. And you're basically trying to, you know, you, you have uh, spices that are worth less and you can trade up and you you get cards from, the, from this row of cards that are available to complete orders. I, I believe, I'm trying to remember exactly how you get victory points. But this game really is one that as soon as I played it, I knew it was one that my wife would really enjoy. Still haven't gotten a hold of it, but it is something that I feel like is um, close enough to entry level that you can get other people into, into it that haven't really played a whole lot of games, but at the same time has enough there to keep gamers interested, maybe more so than Splendor. Hopefully, we'll see. Uh, next up, we've got Legendary, a Marvel deck building game. Now, this is basically the Marvel Cinematic Universe in a box, except even more. Because this has every comic book character you can imagine at this point when you start including all the expansions. Now, I have three expansions, I think. But you've got Spider-Man, Daredevil, uh, the Hulk, um, I, I, mean, I mean, Thor, Black Panther, just every, everything you can imagine as far as really, really obscure heroes, too. And tons of villains to go along with them that you then can match up so many combinations and it's a deck building game so you know you can play where you know each player is building a score up throughout the game but i prefer to play fully cooperative take that scoring out of it either we win or we lose and we don't really worry about the in-game score it just doesn't make sense when you're all heroes and so you're you're collecting heroes that uh, get more and more powerful as the game goes on and you're trying to defeat the mastermind Next up, we have Sagrada at number 17. Now, Sagrada is uh, a game I also learned with Nestor down in Florida at a, at a game store down there. 
This one is, you're, you're building a, uh, again, a very abstracted, a stained glass window, but you're using, it's all dice, these beautiful colored dice. And you know, you're, you're rolling them and you're getting different numbers on them. And there's certain rules for placement and you know, you can't place certain numbers next to each other or certain colors next to each other. And then on top of that, there's, uh, there, there's tools that help you break some of these rules or bend the rules. And it, as you as you build your stained glass window, it is this, it turns into this beautiful design. While at the same time, it's a a very fun and engaging puzzle trying to figure out exactly when is the right time to put this die here in this spot, and is that going to block me from putting it from putting another dice you know next to it later that I'm going to need a, a lot of fun figuring all that out. Number sixteen, we have Zaya Legends of a Drift System. Now, this is one that's fallen a little bit for me. I really, really need to get it back to the table, but there's just other games that have really kind of supplanted it as far as my attention goes. I only have so much attention. Three kids, all that kind of stuff. Z <coughs> Excuse me. Zion Legends of a Drift System. <coughs> I'm going to try to do all this in one take without, without cutting. Zion Legends of a Drift System is a sandbox game, massive space sandbox game, and you're exploring, flipping over all these tiles, you find lawful planets and neutral planets and uh, um, uh, criminal planets. Um, I forget what they're called. You know, they're, they're, they're where all the criminals are. And you can be a criminal. You can be a good guy. You can just be kind of in the middle there. Be a bounty hunter, a merchant. You can uh, just make all your points from trading. It's a victory point game. You're trying to get up to 20 victory points, I think. You can make it from trading or from blowing ships up or for you know from all these different ways from from mining lots of different stuff so so much in Zaya Legends of Drift System a really fun space sandbox game Blood Rage is my number fifteen now with Blood Rage uh, this is a game with it looks like a dudes on the map uh, type game but really there's so much. Uh, different between that and your normal dudes on a map. Yes, there is fighting and all that stuff. There's a lot of card play though. And just because your guys die, that doesn't mean that you're losing. That could even be your plan. There's certain cards where, uh, you know, because they're all Vikings and so they die glorious deaths and they gain victory points from dying. And then they go to Valhalla and then they end up coming back uh, at the end of the round, I believe. And you, you, you play cards out and uh, you know, and, and at the beginning of each round, there's a drafting phase where you select the cards that you're going to use for that particular round. I believe it's three total rounds. And in that round, you know, based on the cards you select, that could determine what your strategy is. Maybe this round you're going to try to have your guys get killed off, but maybe next round you're going to you know get a monster that's going to go and just wreak havoc on your enemies. So then number 14, Dead of Winter, a crossroads game. This one has certainly fallen for me as well. Still a lot of fun. I've played a ton of it. Just played it again recently. This is a hidden trader game. So, you know, you, you might have a trader. You might not. Maybe everybody's on the same team. It's zombie apocalypse. You're all in a colony together. And you're trying to not only achieve the main objective, the main colony objective, but then you have your own personal objective that you're trying to achieve as well. And in doing so... Uh, you might look like you're the traitor just because you're having to be more selfish than you normally would. But you're not the traitor. You're on everybody else's team, but you're just trying to get your objective complete. And because of that, you're hoarding you know, uh, gas, maybe. You're hoarding fuel. Uh, but then at the same time, you're like, hey, guys, look, I'm fighting these zombies. I'm helping out. I'm helping out. And then you end up getting evicted from the colony, maybe. It's a lot of fun. To uh, I, Some of my best gaming memories come from Dead of Winter. All right, number 13 is Small World. This is one that I absolutely have not gotten to the table enough recently. Small World is you have all these fantasy races and you have all these special powers. The races all have the, eat their own individual power and then there's an additional special power and they get mixed and matched every game so that the co different combos are objectively better than other combos. And so the key is which race do you pick and do you pay more to get a race that's farther down the line? Uh, a race, you know, race power combo. And, but then after two or three turns into the game, your race is going to be stretched thin and you're going to put it into decline and you're going to choose a new one. And, and then the, that old race is going to get wiped off the board and the new one you're going to bring in and you're going to use it to collect victory points. And then eventually that one's going to go into decline too. And you usually go through three, maybe even four uh, superpower race combos in a game. It's a lot of fun, a lot of variation available in Small World. Small World. Mantis of Madness 2nd Edition 
is my uh, number 12. And this is a fantastic reboot of the Mansions of Madness, ser Mansions of Madness series. This one has an app that uh, plays the bad guy. So it's a fully cooperative game now, whereas it at one time was a one versus many. And it is obviously, a, uh, or maybe not obviously, a Cthulhu game. Uh, you you know, or a uh, Arkham you know horror series of games. It takes place in that Fantasy Flight Arkham universe. But in this one, you're all going through. It's it's you know down to maybe inside this one house or out just outside the house. Maybe you're in the streets in the docks area, and you're trying to discover what this particular mystery is. It has fighting in it, but fighting really is not the focus. It's more about uncovering the mystery, <clears throat> figuring out what in the world is going on. And then surviving, either getting out, or 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 maybe at the end there is a boss fight. But uh, the, and it has this really clever wound and insanity mechanic where you flip over different cards depending on what's going on. Le I like it a lot. Mansions of Madness Second Edition. Next up we have Mechs versus Minions right here. This is my number eleven. Mechs versus Minions, fully cooperative game, and you are. It takes place in the um, League of Legends. Is that it? League of yeah, League of Legends universe. And it's a massively overproduced game. You have literally a hundred bad guys. You've got your four Yordles, which are the good guys, all of them pre-painted, by the way. It's a programming game, so you uh, draw cards and you make a program on your board. And every round, the program builds and builds and builds until you become much more powerful. You know, er early on, you're only going to be able to move and shoot. Then you'll get a much better move and a much better shoot, or maybe you'll have you know a turn ability in there or some sort of support ability. And it just keeps building and building and building. Got to watch out for uh, uh, get damage that will make your mech go kind of crazy. I'm falling behind here. Got to move on. That was Mech vs. Minions. Next up, we have Star Wars Imperial Assault at my number 10. Now, this one has been rejuvenated by the Star Wars um, uh, uh, Legends of the Alliance app, which makes Imperial Assault fully cooperative now. An app controls the bad guys. And uh, I've really enjoyed playing this one again. I need to get some more expansions now, maybe. I quit I quit with the expansions because I just wasn't into the one versus many for this one, but the app has made it so much better. And it basically, whereas some of the Star Wars games are out there focused on the big picture, the big picture, this is down at a squad level. And you take your, you know, your couple of heroes in and you're fighting the stormtroopers and the, you know, the, the, the E-Web engineers and every now and then an ATST, which is really terrifying. And you have all these different missions. You go through a campaign and tr try to, uh, to to win the campaign at the end. You you collect gear, you collect skill or, or up, uh, gain skills, I should say. A lot of fun. Star Wars Imperial Assault with the app. Number nine is Orleon. Now this is a, uh, it's not, not really worker, I guess, I mean, it's sort of a worker placement. It's a bag building game though. And you collect these workers, put them in the bag, you draw them at the beginning of each round, place them out to do different things. You draw different amounts based on, you know, how you've upgraded yourself. And meanwhile, you're also moving around this map, uh, collecting re uh, resources such as cheese and wine and textiles and stuff like that and building trading posts. And uh, you want to have the most victory points at the end of the game. And it's it's a lot of fun, a lot of really cool choices. This one works really, really well at two players. I've only played it more than two players a couple of times, but I highly recommended it too. And, and I recommended it at more than that because it worked really well then too. There is an expansion for this one that I really want to get my hands on that I feel like uh, it looks like it adds a good bit to it. Have not managed to do that yet, but uh, a couple expansions actually, but the one in particular that makes it a cooperative game where you're fending off some kind of invasion, which is really, uh, seems like a strong departure from what it's at to begin with. Now, next up we have Ghost Stories at number eight. Ghost Stories is a brand new addition to my collection. I actually did a trade for it and I love it. My daughter actually has really gotten into it, which is, uh, she likes board games, but not anything like how I do. So I was really excited when she liked this game so much. And it is a really brutally difficult game where you are uh, some Taoist monks fighting off the invading ghost hordes of, uh, so uh, he's like a necromancer or something like that. He he died, but he's coming back because he's in league with the ghosts and everything to come claim his ashes. And they are coming in. They're they're swarming the town to try to find those ashes, and you've got to fight them off. And there's some really crazy looking ghosts in the game. Uh, the the ghosts are all it's all cards and everything, but still a lot of fun. That's ghost stories. 
Next up at number seven, we have Lords of Waterdeep. Now this is a worker placement game with uh, in the in the Dungeons and Dragons universe, uh, each player is one of the lords of the city of Waterdeep, and they are hiring uh, mercenaries. Uh, you've got fighters and clerics and wizards and rogues. You're hiring each of those, which are represented by different colored cubes, to go and complete quests for uh, for you to gain influence. I believe in this city. I believe it's influence, but essentially it's victory points. The person with the most at the end of the game wins. Pretty straightforward, but then you throw in some intrigue cards and you get, uh, well, watch out, you get a uh, expansion, the expansion, um, Scoundrels of Skullport, I believe that's one of the few expansions I've ever played that I felt this is necessary. Now, Lords of Warty by itself is a nice intro level game. Scoundrels of Skullport really adds a lot of interesting choices to the game. It doesn't make it heavy by any means, but it does add a lot of depth, and I, I love that combination together. Lords of Waterdeep. All right, Charterstone, my number six. Got to catch up. Falling way behind. Charterstone, my number six. This is a legacy worker placement game. This, uh, this game, in my opinion, has done what other legacy games that were not based on previous uh, titles could do. This one is actually a really, really good legacy game, and it's all about building. Whereas many legacy games are about destroying uh, components of, uh, of, the, of the game and everything, this one is about building something. At the end of the campaign, which is 12 games, you have your own unique board that you now can play on indefinitely. This game, you're actually, the whole point of this game is you are building your own worker placement game. It's pretty neat. I like it a lot. About halfway through it, I really need to try to get through it, but that is Charterstone. Next up, we have Pandemic Legacy Season 1 at number 5. I'm playing this for the second time with a group. We are three quarters of the way through, I think, and it's not going well. We just lost four games in a row. We opened up that box that you know you know what's in it if you, if you lost a whole bunch of games. But Pandemic Legacy, speaking of legacy games where you destroy stuff, this one is all about that. You rip up people that die, you rip up certain cards, you open boxes, you put stickers on the board, you write on the board, all this kind of stuff. And you write on Charterstone too, and you put stickers on the board too, but the point is, this one, there's a lot of destruction that goes into it, but the in story and the gameplay is so uh, engaging and fascinating, and I absolutely love this one. Talk about, uh, you know, I was saying how Dead of Winter has some of my favorite gaming memories. This one absolutely, absolutely has some of my best Game Memories of All Time is playing Pandemic Legacy Season 1. Next up, we have Mage Knight, the board game. Mage Knight is this, uh, technically, well, it's not a deck building game, but it has deck building in it. But you only cycle through your deck once a day, and there's like six days in the game. So in, in most scenarios, there's six days. So you're only going to go through your deck six times. However, in the meantime, you are still upgrading your deck, trying to make it better, trying to get get it upgraded enough so that when you get to that final battle, at, usually at one of the cities, if you're playing one of the main scenarios, you can handle what's coming your way because it is difficult to win. Now, this game can be played fully cooperatively. It can be played competitively. It can be played solo. Most of my plays of it have been either solo or two-player. And usually when I play two-player, we don't play player versus player. Uh, in terms of combat, even though we are still playing against each other in terms of scoring. Uh, as you play, you earn experience points, your character levels up, they gain more abilities on top of the cards that you're putting in the deck. You have lots of interesting choices. Do I burn down this monastery and take the, the, the artifact, or do I just let the monastery stand and, and instead have them help me, you know, train me in various uh, advanced tactics and that sort of thing? Next up, number three, we have Gloomhaven, which I'm shocked that Gloomhaven was not number one. If you had asked me when I got Gloomhaven, what would be number one come May when I built this list, Gloomhaven 100% would have been on this list or would have been on, in the number one spot. Gloomhaven is a dungeon crawl technically. I mean, you are going through dungeons, but it, there's no dice whatsoever. There is a, a deck of cards that you flip over to add some randomness to it, but that you're able to upgrade the deck and take bad cards out, add, add good cards in. Everything else is done with card play. As your character levels up, you gain access to more and more cards. You unlock new characters. 
Uh, a lot of people say this is a legacy game. It's not really a legacy. Uh, I, I believe people feel like that because uh, you are putting stickers on this one board. So I guess there, that is a legacy element. And then you're unlocking new characters in cardboard boxes that, uh, that you don't have access to until you complete certain life goals for other characters. Gloomhaven, that's number three. Number two, Seventh Continent. Seventh Continent, I have... Oh, i got to get that one back to the table. I want to so bad. But my daughter and I have a game saved right now in there, which is why I haven't, I haven't gotten more plays of it in. This one is this huge open world that is the same uh, geographically every time you play. But depending on which curse you play, which is essentially a fancy way of saying mission, you might start in different places. You have different objectives, that sort of thing. And you don't even really know what your objective is until you investigate. And uh, this is one where it's all card play. You're, you're pulling from an action deck and uh, it's, it's so much fun. It's so good. Um, I, I, I just don't feel like there's much I can say without spoiling it, which is why I don't want to say too much about this one. All right. But that brings us to my number one, which is Kingdom Death Monster. This game has absolutely, completely obsessed my mind. I cannot get enough of it. I have like four or five different campaigns going on with different people. Right before I filmed this video, I played the, the second uh, second game of, of a new campaign with a buddy of mine who's starting it. He looks like he's really getting into it. I have, I have been obsessively scouring eBay trying to find a good deal, which is really hard to find for these. And I'm really hoping that uh, the expansions are going to come back in stock soon. I'll just stop messing with eBay. Uh, this game is just this dark, dreadful uh, existence that you wake up in and you're just trying to survive. You don't have speech. You don't have any technology whatsoever, just stone and a loincloth and that's it. And you fight these horrific monsters. You slowly build up your civilization. And the game is more about making sure your civilization survives than any individual survivor. Uh, you know, like for instance, in the game we just played, we had... Uh, uh, three uh, a survivor die on a mission and then two more survivors die because of plague when we got back to the settlement but then twins were born and so you know it's like this this give and take life and death thing it's really fantastic i've gone over to, over my time here that's kingdom death monster my number one game of all time as of may 2018 all right y'all so i hope you enjoyed this uh video i will tell you a little spoiler legacy of dragon Hold did not come in until after i had made this list so there's a strong possibility in a year this game is going to actually make this list. I've really enjoyed this one so far. This is like a choose your own adventure game on steroids. So we'll give Legacy of Dragonhold an honorable mention for this video. Really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. If you like my channel, please subscribe. You can uh, buy board, board offline t-shirts over at geekygoodies.com. You can find me on Twitter. I've got Pod Pledge. And until next time, if you're bored online, board offline.